Our second speaker here, man who hopefully needs uh, no introduction, is uh, Nigel Bigger, the Regis Professor of Moral and Pastoral uh, Theology, Director of the Ethics and Empire Project at the University of Oxford. And uh, his talk is called, Where's the Virtue in Universities? Good. So, um, first the story, uh, then the analysis, and finally some proposals. Um, early December 2017, uh, my wife and I were at Heathrow Airport, uh, waiting to board our flight um, to Nuremberg, where we were going to uh, celebrate our wedding anniversary. Uh, as one often can't, I couldn't resist checking my email for just one last time. Um, and my curiosity was aroused when I saw in my inbox um, uh, a message from the university's public, public relations directorate, as I think it calls itself. So I clicked on it, and what I found uh, was a message that told me, first of all, that my Ethics and Empire project had become the target of an online denunciation by a group of students, and secondly, uh, thank God, uh, that the university was already um, up and defending my competence to run such a thing. So began a public row that raged for the best part of a month. Well, it's raged since then, but it raged at uh, high temperature for about a month. Uh, four days after I flew to Germany, the eminent imperial historian who had conceived the project with me abruptly resigned. Within a week of the first uh, denunciation, two further ones appeared, this time manned by professional academics, the first comprising 58 colleagues at Oxford, two of them as it happens in this college, the second uh, about 200 academics from around the world. And uh, for over a fortnight or three weeks, my name was in the press every day. So, what had I done to attract all this unexpected attention? Three things. In late 2015 and early 2016, I had offered a partial defence of Cecil Rhodes during the Rhodes Must Fall campaign in Oxford. Then second, in late uh, November 2017, I published a piece in the Times newspaper in which I ref uh, referred approvingly to uh, Bruce Gillies' controversial article, The Case for Colonialism, and argued that we British have reason to feel pride as well as shame about our imperial past. Note, pride as well as shame. And a few days later, third, I finally got round to publishing an online account of the Ethics and Empire project, whose first conference had in fact been held the previous July. Uh, contrary to what the critics then and even now seem to think, uh, this project is not at all designed to defend British Empire or even Empire in general. Rather, it aims to select and analyse critiques or evaluations of Empire from ancient China to the modern <coughs> period. Uh, a classic instance of such a critique would be Augustine's City of God, its critique of late Roman Empire. The rows about roads and empire have taught me several important things. One of them is the distinction between several kinds of appearance and reality. Four kinds, I think. No, five kinds. <laughs> During the debate on the, on the motion that roads must fall in the Oxford Union in early 2016, uh, so the, the, the proposition was the roads must fall, I was arguing for the opposition. Um, so as long as I listened to the concerted applause that erupted every time someone for the proposition spoke, uh, I, I was under the impression that 95% of people in the room were in favour of, um, of the proposition. But after listening to this several times, I thought I'd stop listening, I, I start watching. And what I saw was that every time the supporters erupted, most members of the audience actually sat on their hands saying nothing. In the end, the proposition won narrowly, roads fell, at least according to the Oxford Union. Um, um, and in fact, the, the, their victory was helped by, by yours truly, who was so unnerved by the hostile atmosphere 
uh, and having to run the gauntlet between uh, two heckling lines that I end up walking through the wrong door. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be careful next time. <laughs> The second thing I learned was how zealous minorities can dominate and manipulate uncertain majorities. Before Christmas 2015, the Fellows of Oriel College, in response to the noise of the student campaign in favour of Rhodes Must Fall, voted to remove a plaque commemorating Rhodes from one of its buildings. It did so because a small minority of colleagues, mainly historians with no expertise in empire, supported the student's case and seemed to know what they were talking about. And so the majority, who knew next to nothing about the history, but were aware that decent people do not speak up in favour of capitalism or empire, deferred to them. The majority deferred. However, when the press unleashed a storm of protest and alumni be became seriously and publicly upset, the fellows of Oriel started to pay attention and reversed their, their decision the following month. Which brings me to my third insight. The discrepancy between what passes for common sense in universities and what passes for common sense in the general public. In the Empire Raw of December 2017, both the press reaction and the email correspondence I received indicated that the general public was astonished and appalled by the intemperate views and behaviour of some of my academic critics. What is more forth? This is my fourth point. Among the people who wrote to encourage me were some of the grandchildren of the subjects of empire. One British Indian consultant in palliative care uh, um, wrote to me to say that his grandfather had been among those in the Jallianwala Bug in Amritsar in 1919 when General Dyer had his troops fire on an unarmed crowd for, crowd for 10 minutes. I can't remember whether he said his grandfather was killed. Nevertheless, Raj uh, wrote that, uh, notwithstanding that, he agreed with me. He thought British Empire contained both good and bad. And agreed with me that the British have reason for, for both pride and shame. What's more, although the row did cost the ethics and empire uh, its two white Anglo-Saxon historians, I, I'm glad to report that it has now been repopulated with four others, only one of which is Anglo-Saxon. Uh, uh, and includes two British Indians and one British Iranian, all of whom think, as I do, that empire is a morally variable phenomenon whose moral qualities deserve thinking about. So when my critics claim to speak with the authority of the champions of the victims of empire, or at least of their descendants, they really don't. Unsurprisingly, except to racists, not all the subjects or their descendants think the same thing, and points of view actually transgress racial boundaries. The final, the fifth thing I learnt from the controversy is the discrepancy between the appearance of intellectual authority carried by the massed ranks of online academic protesters and the reality. Although I was initially unnerved to be the object of the scorn of 58 Oxford colleagues, on further reflection I noticed that 58 out of more than 1,600 academic and research staff in the humanities and social sciences alone is really not so considerable. What's more, most of them were not historians and few of them were senior. Further still, not one of them was an ethicist, which might have given them pause before they presumed to damn a project entitled Ethics and Empire. But it didn't. The truth is that I was the only professional ethicist in the room. In general, therefore, what I learned from the Empire Rao was that in the case of my noisy anti-imperialist critics, the emperors are actually rather naked. End of story. Now for the problem. What's the problem? In brief, and I say this as, as an ethicist, so I, I would be sensitive to this, in brief the problem is an alarming lack of moral virtue. Let me explain. I take it for granted, and I teach my students, the duty to be scrupulously fair in representing what other people say and write. And if there are ambiguities, I teach them the, the duty to interpret those ambiguities charitably in the direction of the strongest possible construction. 
Only then should one begin to criticise, because only then will one's critique be maximally cogent. The ability to be fair and charitable to views that one really dislikes, or that threaten things you really care about, takes patience and courage. The ability to be fair, to give credit where credit is due, and to learn from uncongenial or threat threatening views, takes courageous humility and honesty. <coughs> so, fairness, charity, patience, courage, humility, honesty. These are not technical skills, they are moral virtues. And if we academics don't teach them and model them to students, then we can expect intemperance, arrogance, <coughs> ideological deafness, distortion and defamation. And if we permit such things in students, we will also get them in articulate citizens. So it's my view that university teachers cannot help but promote intellectual virtue <coughs> or vice, and that we have a civic duty to promote the former. But in over 30 years of teaching in universities, I've never once heard a colleague own such responsibility. Indeed, any suggestions on my part that they should own it have usually been met with a mixture of bafflement and suspicion. Judging by the behaviour of my critics, the result is that we now have a generation of young academics, many of whom, not having been taught the virtues, are displaying lots of devices. Now, now of course, um, there is plenty of room among us for discussions as to which virtues we should teach and um, uh, just how far we should extend charity. So there's plenty of debate we could have about that, but we don't ever talk about it. <coughs> it's been my consistent experience of the critics, first, that they're not interested in what I actually say or write, and this relates to an Amy made so comment, that they're not interested in facts. Uh, they're not interested in the give and take of reasons. Early on, I wrote and published three responses to their online denunciations. To date, not one of the over 250 signatories, two of them in this college and a stone throw, stone throw away from my office, not one has bothered to respond. Mm -hmm. Instead, they persist in false, unargued, defamatory attributions. Have I ever said that the white race is biologically superior to other races and naturally destined to rule the world? <laughs> no. And yet, according to Dr. Priyam Bada Gopal of Cambridge University, I'm a racist, <coughs> a white supremacist, and a bigot. Have I ever said that British, that I think the British Empire was an unalloyed good? No. And yet, according to Professor John Wilson of King's College London, my view is simply that, and I quote, empire is great. <laughs> Have I ever asserted that British imperialism generally, and I quote, introduced order to the non-Western world? No. I would never say anything quite so s historically stupid. L let me be clear, um, um, and, and this is a point that Bruce Gilley makes in his, in his article. Um, the, the, there have been times historically when native peoples have voluntarily uh, entered colonial territories because for various reasons they, they found rule under uh, in a colonial, colonial, colonial territory preferable. So. Um, I was told by uh, Ping Chung Lo uh, from Hong Kong uh, 18 months ago across the road in Christchurch that uh, between, two and th well, between one and two million Chinese uh, fled China into the British colony of Hong Kong in the 50s and 60s. Hong Kong was not a democracy, but it did, it did have the rule of law. Um, he told me that because his grandma was one of the refugees. Uh, he also told me that his grandma never learned English but she did learn to become a lifelong devotee of Princess Di. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never said such a stupid thing, but that didn't stop uh, the literary critic Nilanjana Roy from attributing such an idiotic claim to me in the pages of the Financial Times two weekends ago. Now the thing about straw men is that there's no point in erecting one unless you're having difficulty hitting the real target. So these distorted representations do pay me the backhanded compliment of implying that what I actually say is really quite hard to quarrel with, which is very reassuring, but it doesn't stand much to the credit of my incontinent critics, whose hostile zeal propels them so very far ahead of the truth. And most of these people have university degrees, many of them have doctorates, 
and some occupy senior posts in some of our, our most prestigious academic institutions. Instead of reasoned arguments against what I actually say, what my critics have offered are ad hominem attacks on my person. I am, of course, white, male, getting closer to my sell-by date, and as a denizen of Christchurch, Oxford, irredeemably privileged. Therefore, nothing I say could possibly be worth listening to, and whatever comes out of my mouth, according to Dr. Gopal, is, and I quote, vomit. <laughs> The, the fact that Dr. Gopal opines from Churchill College, Cambridge, and Dr. Wilson from King's College, London, doesn't give them pause. But my critics are not at all big on irony. Let's be fair and give credit where credit is due. It is absolutely true that the limits of my own privileged social experience and position could make me deaf to the voices of the victims of empire and other victims. It really could. And maybe I am. It could do, but it needn't. After all, privilege has evidently not stopped the ears of Professors Gopal and Wilson. And besides, as I've indicated, the voices of the victims of empire or of their descendants don't all say the same thing. Some of them actually agree with me, not with my critics. A third pathological feature is the appeal not to reason but to authority, the authority of an alleged consensus. This manifests itself in claims that things I have asserted, such as a balance in favour of the benefits of empire, have been long discredited, discredited among right-thinking people. Well, apart from the fact that I've never asserted such a thing, I'm not as a rule much impressed by sheer appeals to authority, even though I am a Christian believer. I don't much appeal to, to I'm not impressed by appeals to authority as such. While I do respect the prima facie authority of a consensus of experts, it has been known for a majority of experts to get it wrong. And academics, as we all know, are perfectly capable of behaving like sheep. Uh, uh, the consensus in German universities in the 1930s was heavily Nazi. And so to tell me that something has been discredited in other people's eyes merely leaves me wondering, but are they right? What are their reasons? Fourth and finally, instead of listening carefully to what I say and what I don't say, instead of making carefully reasoned objections, instead of exercising the virtues of fairness, charity, patience, courage, humility and honesty, my critics have resorted to political leverage. They have tried to get this university to shut the e Ethics of Empire project down. This was the explicit aim of Dr. Gopal, whose name appeared at the top of the several hundred signatories of the third online denunciation. In a tweet she sent on the 13th of December 2017 at the very inception of the row, and referring to the project, she wrote, oh my God, this is serious shit. We need to shut this down, in capital letters. So, it, you know, not much ambiguity there. <laughs> Almost a year later, at a panel discussion at which um, Eric and David Goodhart were present in a uh, policy exchange in London, John Wilson, whose name appears just below Gopal's in the list of signatories, denied that the online letter had any repressive intention at all and actually accused me of inventing uh, my own victimhood. <laughs> when I heard of this, uh, I wrote to uh, uh, Dr. Wilson as follows, and I quote, you offered an, a disingenuous account of the intention of your online letter, claiming that it was designed to open up dialogue rather than to repress my project. Counting against your account are the following facts. One, the letter was addressed not to me, but to my university. Two, <coughs> of the 200 signatories, you are the only one to have made any overture toward dialogue in the 12 months since. Three, the letter was entirely focused on attacking the university's support of my project, the word support appearing five times in five paragraphs. And four, Dr. Priya Gopal's name appears right at the top of the five leading signatories, and as you well know, her stated intention, which I've documented from Twitter, was to shut down my project. End of quote. The letter with that paragraph was emailed to Dr. Wilson six months ago on the 2nd of December 2018 to date. I've received no reply. 
So much for the problem, as I've experienced it and its components. So what has my recent experience taught me about the solution? Uh, four things, and, and let me make clear. Um, there are many other solutions we've heard around this table already. I, I, I'm not presenting these as the solution. They are part of the solution. Uh, first of all, the support I received from the very top of my own university <laughs> has been enormously important. Um, from the very beginning, the university authorities had defended my right to pursue whatever daft research on the ethics of empire I choose to, provided it's not obviously illegal. And the project still runs. It meets next month. However, rhetorical support from the top is not a sufficient solution because it doesn't necessarily prevent subtle but substantial problems further down the institutional hierarchy. It doesn't stop colleagues applying illiberal political criteria to the admission of students or to the appointment of senior members. Nor does it stop vulnerable, junior, untenured colleagues from having to ask that their names be kept off the list of participants at meetings like this one, not in fact this one, uh, but there was one in May at which Bruce was present where a, uh, a graduate student of this college, no, excuse me, a, a junior scholar at this college, asked for his name to be kept off any uh, um, uh, list of participants lest uh, senior members uh, in his field get to know about it. Uh, and, and his concern was uh, the possibility of damage to his career. I first raised these issues in the uh, in-house uh, uh, Oxford magazine early last year, which Tim Horder uh, edits. He's here somewhere, Tim, or was. Uh, and I hoped that it might stimulate some kind of um, discussion within the university about these issues. But so far, to my knowledge, what I wrote has been met with complete silence. So if support for academic freedom from the top is the first part of the solution, open discussion of these issues further down the totem pole is the second. And we don't have that yet. The third uh, part of the solution is access to independent streams of funding. And here I, I row in behind uh, Tom. Uh, in 2016, uh, I and my historian collaborator on the Ethics and Empire project submitted an application for 50% funding to an internal university research fund. Both I and he had considerable experience in submitting and evaluating applications, and we would reckoned that our, our own application was very strong. We would, of course, but we did have experience. Nevertheless, it was turned down because it was supposed to lack diversity and because those involved were all drawn from elite universities. That was our black mark. We had chosen colleagues from elite universities. And that's here. That's the objection here. <laughs> that would have been the end of the project, were it not for the fact that as director of the McDonald Center, I have at my disposal an independent stream of funding. So Peter, thank you. If it weren't for the McDonald Center, this meeting wouldn't happen. I, I mean, I, or I, I'd, ha I'd have to go begging for funds elsewhere, and good God knows what quest questions I would have been asked. Right? So if, if it weren't for the independent stream of funding, of which I have complete control, this meeting wouldn't happen, and the Ethics and Empire project would be dead. So if dissident thought is to flourish in universities, it needs to have access to funding that is beyond the control of university committees who apply criteria such as diversity, which are politically biased, morally dubious, and put beyond question. Finally, and perhaps most important, academics have to be persuaded to take responsibility for promoting in students and future citizens the virtues of fairness, charity, patience, courage, humility, and honesty. The importance of this is demonstrated by the story of Damien McBride, which some of you will know about. Uh, in 1989, McBride became the spin doctor of Gordon Brown, then Chancellor in the UK government. And he carried on playing that role uh, when Brown became Prime Minister. Uh, because of his um, manner of behaviour, he was fondly known as Mad Dog or McPoison. In 2009, he overreached himself precipitated a scandal and was kicked out of Dining Street and into public disgrace. 
Four years later, a somewhat uh, chastened McBride published his own account of what had happened and, more confessionally, of how his life had come to such a pass. The, the title of the book was summed up in, uh, summed up the, the point, which was Power Trip. That was the title of the book. And chapter two is entitled Warning Signs, and it begins, I wasn't always a nasty bastard, <laughs> but, you, but you could argue the signs were there. One of the signs came to light during his student career at uh, Peterhouse in Cambridge, frequently the source of physical violence and indirectly responsible for setting fire to one of the college's 13th century buildings. McBride succeeded in pulling, over, pulling the wool over the Don's eyes with a combination of avoidance, obfuscation and diversion. As he sums it up, quote, I left university hooked on the intricacies of power and policy making with a talent for avoiding the truth, a win-or-die competitive streak and a penchant for negative, thuggish tactics and a reckless disregard for the consequences of my actions. There was only one possible career choice. <laughs> Politics. <laughs> if university teachers don't take responsibility for promoting virtuous intellect, adolescent students will receive the general impression that real adults do not care about such things. So when they leave the womb of their alma mater for the big wide world, or when they stay safely within it, growing from student into professor, they will embark not at all upon a moral adventure, but upon a power trip. Thanks. <laughs>